सलाम नमस्ते आदाब एंड वेलकम ऑन टुडे इवेंट टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू हियर प्रोफेसर अमीन अहमद ऑन हाउ टीपू सुल्तान एंड हैदर अली इन्फ्लुएंस अमेरिका इज वार ऑफ इंडिपेंडेंस and the introductory remarks will be given by our own dr nazir ahmed who doesn't uh, need any or hardly needs any introduction any more on this uh, forum and concluding remarks will be given by a very well known scholar dr m a muqtadar khan uh, i remember at least 14 or 15 years back he was chief guest at our sarsi at day dinner here at aligarh alumni association Uh, he is a professor of department of political science and international relations uh, at university of delaware so welcome you all and i'll invite now dr nazir ahmed for the introductory remarks thank you razi sahab uh, today's presentation the influence of tipu sultan and hyder ali on america's war of independence is a fascinating one there is so little written about the subject matter primarily because much of the relevant information was locked up until 2010 in the united states national archives in washington dc history is infinitely elastic events that may seem insignificant today may become turning points in world history tomorrow it is in this spirit that one has to examine the web of interactions between the kingdom of mysore and the americans between the years 1775 and 1785 if i may have the first slide please that's the map of the world in the year 1700 a quick look at a map of the world in 1700 shows that the land mass of asia was dominated by china india and the ottoman empire india under aurangzeb was the richest country in the world accounting for 25% of global gdp followed closely by china at 23% the ottomans were the dominant power in europe although they were increasingly challenged by the habsburgs and the russians while these empires dominated the land mass the oceans were a preserve of the west european powers how did it happen that while the mighty empires of asia amassed immense power on land but lost it to the europeans at sea history moves like a mighty river with discernible bends Let's recall the critical events that helped shape the map of 1700. In 1492, Granada, the last bastion of Muslim power in Spain, fell to the conquistadores. The same year, Columbus discovered America. Four years later, in 1496, Vasco da Gama sailed around the Cape of Good Hope in Africa, and with the help of an East African sailor, Ahmed ibn Majid, discovered a sea route to India. In 1502, Vasco da Gama returned. This time, at the head of a flotilla of gunboats, devastated the thriving trading centers around the rim of the Indian Ocean. Goa was captured in 1511. Meanwhile, Spain decimated the ancient Mayan and Aztec civilizations of the Americas. Mayan gold and Aztec silver flowed by the shipload to Spain. The loot from the Americas. and the pepper from india attracted piracy from england france and morocco spain tried to dissuade england from piracy using negotiations it failed and launched the spanish armada in 1588 that was decimated the portuguese were even more foolhardy in 1578 king sebastian of portugal invaded morocco and was killed at the battle of al khasr al kabir The decline of Spanish and Portuguese power gave an opportunity to the North Europeans. The hinge was the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. It was in 1600 that Queen Elizabeth chartered 
the East India Company to compete for the trade with Asia. The Dutch followed suit with the Dutch East Indies Company in 1602. The rise of the joint stock company as an institution of trade was the single most important political economic development of the 17th century. What enables common people to achieve uncommon goals is their loyalty to institutions that pull together and channel the energies. The eclipse of Asia, and more specifically of the Muslim world, was due in large part to its neglect of naval technology and its failure to evolve institutions that could successfully compete with the joint stock company. The English position improved both in America and in India in the 17th century. In 1620, the pilgrims landed in Massachusetts. In 1639, the East India Company established a factory at Madras, today Chennai. In 1664, they overran the Dutch colonies in America, seized New Amsterdam, and renamed it New York. In, by 1713, the Dutch were exhausted and competition between the English and the French sharpened. The rivalry was bitter both in India and in America. The French and the British East India companies both intervened in the wars of succession that raged in India after the death of Emperor Aurangzeb. In 1739, Nadir Shah invaded Delhi and carried out the Peacock Throne. 1757, the British won the Battle of Plassey. The loot from Bengal provided the fuel for the Industrial Revolution in England. In 1761, at the Battle of Panipat, the Maratha armies were soundly defeated by Ahmad Shah Abdali. The regression of Maratha power gave an opportunity to smaller powers like the Kingdom of Mysore, which had long suffered under devastating Maratha invasions. It was in this melee, in the Mysore wars against the invading Marathas, that a young army officer, Hyder Ali, rose and established the independent kingdom of Mysore, which was to play such an important part on the world scene, including in the calculations of American revolutionaries fighting for the independence. This is a bird's eye view of the rise of England and the birth of the kingdom of Mysore. I have covered it in depth in my book, Islam in Global History, first published by Suhail Academy, Lahore in 2001 and translate into several languages. It's available on the website historyofislam.com. There is no better person than Professor Amin Ahmed to tackle the fascinating story of the interaction between the American revolutionaries and the kingdom of Mysore. Professor Amin is an empirical historian. In this, he follows the rich traditions of al-Masudi, al-Idrisi, and Ibn Khaldun. Oftentimes what is called history is a rehash of secondhand and thirdhand reports backed up by a compendium of references. Amin, on the other hand, visits the sites of historical events, records eyewitness accounts, searches through primary sources, and then writes his story. His focus on South India and more specifically on Tipu Sultan and Hyder Ali puts him in a unique position to present this subject matter with clarity, authenticity, and authority. Professor Amin Ahmed, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Raji Saab, if uh, you can go back to the first slide, uh, the world it? map, Where the world it? map. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, uh, my presentation today covers a little known but important aspect of the historical connection between India and the American War of Independence. In 2010, the National Archives in Washington DC collaborated with the University of Virginia to host historical documents related to the founding fathers on a website. This website, Founders Online, was launched in 2013 and now has over 181,000 freely available documents. It deals with various aspects of the interactions between events in the United States and India 
during the last quarter of the 18th century, both political and personal. The literature on Indo-European relations in the 18th century, particularly on Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan's connections with the French has been readily available for many decades, particularly from British sources. But access to information on Indo-US relations from the same period eased only recently, thanks to the internet. Next slide, please. The correspondence and intelligence gathering of America's freedom founding fathers reveals they not only keenly monitored British affairs across the globe, but also desired that Britain lose to her enemies, particularly to Mysore Kingdom in India, where it faced its stiffest military and political challenge. They believed that the success of Britain's enemies elsewhere would help America achieve its independence not only faster, but also on its terms. The Kingdom of Mysore during this period was ruled first by Hyder Ali, upon whose death in 1782, his son Tipu Sultan succeeded him. The political boundaries of Mysore Kingdom occupied a large part of Southern India, including the current states of Karnataka, parts of Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, and Southern Maharashtra. Next slide, please. Why was there an uprising in America? In the early 1770s, frustration brewed against Britain's trade practices in its colonies in America. These colonies had no choice but to pay high taxes on the goods imported cheaply from other British colonies like India and sold to them at a premium. The colonies were prohibited from exporting to or trading directly with each other. The shareholders of British East India Company, the middleman, profited immensely from this. 13 American colonies decided to form their own nation, the United States of America. Hello? The, the Second Continental Congress representing these colonies declared independence from Great Britain on July 4th, 1776. Next slide, please. Why did the American revolutionaries look to Mysore? The Americans found support in the French who were keen to get back at the British for their defeat in the Seven Years' War of 1754 to 1763. In addition to France and the American colonies, England had to face the fury of Spain, Netherlands, and native kingdoms in India in what turned out to be a conflict that was fought across European colonies spanning much of the globe. As Britain tried to subjugate the United States, the latter looked to Britain's enemies to draw inspiration in its own struggle. The rulers of the Mysore Kingdom were at the vanguard of opposition to Britain and thus found themselves at the center of this unprecedented international conflict. Not surprisingly, the Americans took a keen interest in Britain's conflict with the Mysore Kingdom, many thousands of miles away. Next slide, please. How did the revolutionaries come to know of Mysore Kingdom? Though Louis XVI, the French king, recognized American independence on February 6, 1778, some Frenchmen seemed eager to put the revolutionaries in touch with Britain's enemies elsewhere, even before that. The earliest formal introduction of an Indian ruler to America's founding father seems to be a letter in French to Benjamin Franklin by Comte de Tressan, Lieutenant General of the Armies of France. In one of his many letters to Franklin, which he wrote from Paris, on June 24, 1777. Tresson called Hyder Ali a brave Mughal prince and offered to put the US Congress into an intimate correspondence with a European working for Hyder Ali. Hyder Ali was known to have Europeans on his payroll. 
Next slide, please. Benjamin Franklin was a scientist and the leading figure of the American independence movement. Between 1776 and 1778, he spent time in France and garnered support for an independent America. He became the country's first diplomat in 1779 when his credentials were received by the French court. He served there until 1785. The Americans knew of the happenings in India from non-French European residents of the United States who had traveled to the East Indies either for, or either for commerce or to fight for the colonial powers. East Indies referred to a wide geographical area embracing South Asia and the many archipelagos of Southeast Asia. The British East Indies during the American Revolution was chiefly peninsular India and Sri Lanka, along with a few islands in the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. Next slide, please. The American revolutionaries tracked Britain's fate across the globe. One letter points to this is that of Jonathan Williams to John Adams dated March 28, 1779. Adams was a leading figure in America's freedom movement. A lawyer who graduated from Harvard, he was a delegate to the first and second continental congresses. He was an American diplomat in France and Holland during the war. He was also on the American team that negotiated peace. After the war, he was elected as America's first vice president under George Washington and succeeded him as the nation's second president in 1797. Next slide, please. But the question is, what was happening in India then? At this time, on the other side of the globe, Hyder Ali wanted to get back at the British for not honoring the terms that ended the first Anglo-Mysore war on April 3rd, 1769. The treaty required the two sides to help each other in case of external attacks. Peshwa, Mother Rao's uncle, Triambuk Mama, invaded Mysore Kingdom in 1771 and plundered numerous towns and temples. Among the places plundered was the Hindu pilgrimage center of Melukote. The fear of advancing Maratha soldiers forced Brahmins to desert the place. The Marathas then set a fire to the Rathas or Rats, human drawn, drawn chariots that carry Hindu gods. They did it apparently to lay their hands on the iron in these chariots. The fire then spread to the many temples around that were burnt in the process. When Hyder Ali sought British aid, the latter renegade on their promise. Hyder Ali was forced to pay a huge ransom to the Marathas. In early 1780, Hyder Ali came up with a grand plan to oust the East India Company from India upon learning about the gathering war clouds in Europe. He made peace overture, over to, overtures to the Marathas and the Nizam who agreed to an alliance. Clearly, Hyder Ali had the vision to think about the dangers of Britain as a colonial power in India and wanted his contemporary Indian rulers to act together to save future generations of Indians from European colonialism. How did the American revolutionaries view the developments in India? Next slide, please. The American revolutionaries exchanged information about these developments in India and their intelligence reports mentioned British ships sailing to India in 1780. In his letter to the president of Continental or the Confederate Congress dated June 10, 1780, John Adams threw more light on the conflict in India. He provided the Congress with details of the movement of British Admiral Hughes' squadron in which he referred to Hyder Ali as the famous Hyder Ali. This letter was read in the Congress on September 25th, 
1780. Now, what role did the Anglo-Mysore conflict play in the Americas of uh, freedom negotiations? Adams in his letter to Hendrik Kalkin, dated October 27, 1780, stated that the English defeats in India would be of a greater consequence than if the same had occurred elsewhere. The Americans achieved their most spectacular victory of their independence war when British General Charles Cornwallis surrendered to George Washington at Yorktown on October 19, 1781. Washington was the commander in chief of United States of America from July 3, 1775 to December 23, 1783. He was elected America's first president in 1790. The victorious Americans held Hyder Ali in high esteem. Nine days later, on October 28th, the, the revolutionaries at Trenton, New Jersey, celebrated Washington's victory and also that of Hyder Ali's in India. Two days later, James Madison wrote to Edmund Pendleton from Philadelphia and shared details of Washington's victory, including the prisoners of war taken. In this letter, he celebrated Britain's losses across the globe and wrote that British territories in India, which were the rich source of commerce and money, were probably lost forever. He predicted those losses may force the British to sue for peace with the American revolutionaries. James Madison was an attorney by profession. In 1776, he became the first speaker of the House of Delegates. Two years later, he was the president of the convention that ratified the Constitution of the United States. As the war entered 1782, the revolutionaries continued to hope that America would get, it in, get its independence, independence faster thanks to British reverses in India. John Adams wrote to John Jay on February 28, 1782 from Amsterdam that they had encouraging news from, East, from the East Indies due to which it appeared that the affairs of the Americans would go well and that they might be able to come to a treaty with the English soon. Next slide, please. Despite their loss at Yorktown, the British harassed the Americans at the seas. In 1782, the state of Pennsylvania purchased USS Hyder Ali, a small sloop or a single mast ship named after Hyder Ali. The state then equipped this ship with 16 six pounder guns. 23 year old Lieutenant Joshua Barney of the United States Navy was honored with the command of Hyder Ali. Assigned with recruiting men, Barney used a poem penned by Philip Morin Frenou to attract young American men to the ship. The poem exalted Hyder Ali's bravery against the British with the following lines, and I quote, Come all ye lads who know no fear, to wealth and honor with me steer. In the Hyder Ali privateer, commanded by brave Barney, from an Eastern prince, she takes her name, who, smit with freedom's sacred flame, usurping Britain's brought to shame, his country's wrongs avenging, come, all ye lads that know no fear. With hand and heart united all, prepared to conquer to fall. Attend my lads to honor's call, embark in our Hyder Ali. On April 8th, Barney's Hyder Ali captured the much larger British warship HMS War. HMS General Monk. 
This decisively tilted the balance of power in favor of the United States. Ballads were sung on the streets of Philadelphia praising Hyder Ali. As negotiations for recognition of an independent United States continued, the concessions to the Americans oscillated with the military fortunes of the British and its chief opponents in India, that is the French and Hyder and his son Tipu. In a letter dated June 13, 1782, John Adams wrote to Benjamin Franklin from The Hague about the state of Britain's internal affairs. He stated that the British had gained victories in East Indies and would be reluctant to make concessions to its opponents elsewhere. Adams wished to communicate with the enemies of the British and, and persuade them to carry on the fighting in places where they were sure of victories rather than where they would be defeated. This perhaps indicated the desire that America's founding fathers had to communicate with the Mysore rulers and guide them in their military conflicts. Next slide, please. On June 25th, 1782, Madison wrote to Edmund Randolph from Philadelphia and discussed issues that affected America's independence. Madison wrote about Hyder Ali regaining an upper hand over veteran Englishman Ayer Coote in the battlefield. James Madison was elected America's fourth president in 1809. The British affairs in India continued to be a factor in the negotiations for the Americans. As mentioned in the letter by John Adams to Robert R. Livingston dated August 18, 1782 at The Hague. The next day, John Adams wrote to James Warren from the same place that if the British received good news from India, it would impact peace in America. James Warren was a member of the Continental Congress from 1774 to 81 and one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And he was the president of the Massachusetts State Senate in 1781. He was a cousin of John Adams, and he is also referred to as father of the American Revolution. Next slide, please. The father-son combination of Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan continued to stand as a rock against British expansion in India. In late September 1782, peace negotiations between the Americans and the British were on in Paris. During the negotiations, John Adams looked for good news from India on an hourly basis. He wrote to Robert Livingston on September 23rd from The Hague, that the Americans looked for good news from India and elsewhere on an hourly basis at a stage in negotiations where they were highly optimistic. He expressed his fears that if the British did not receive some very bad news from the East Indies or other places, they would be more reluctant to give America its independence. Livingston was then America's first ever Secretary of Foreign Affairs in the Department of Foreign Affairs created that year by the Continental Congress. Next slide, please. Now let's look at the Battle of Polylore, its global context, and how this war, this battle, inspired the American revolutionaries. In July 1780, Hyder Ali's armies burst into territories of the British in southern India and scored a, a series of spectacular victories. This included the defeat of Colonel Bailey at the Battle of Polylur, located today in Tamil Nadu, on September 10, 1780. This humiliating defeat of Colonel Bailey was due to an army led by Tipu Sultan. The Mysorean rockets played a major role in their defeat. Many British writers concede that it was among the, their worst defeats suffered on a battlefield. 
1914, 134 years later, British writer F.E. Penny wrote this, and I quote, the defeat of the English under the unfortunate Colonel Bailey in 1780 by Hyder Ali, 700 Europeans and 5,000 sepoys were killed or taken prisoner on that occasion with guns and ammunition, tents and stores. It was one of the worst disasters that ever happened to the British arms in India. Maestre de la Tour of Frenchmen headed troops of Hyder Ali. He published a biography of Hyder Ali in 1784. He described an event in the Second Anglo-Mysore War where Hyder Ali at one point in time asked for views of his council on whether to wait for French help before attacking the British. According to the author, Tipu suggested and inspired everyone around him that the attack against the British should go ahead without awaiting French help. This Frenchman eulogized Tipu for his role in the victory at Polylor with the following words, and I quote, it was this young prince who decided the battle that was attended with the deaths of Colonels Bailey and Fletcher. By taking advantage of the disorder, the English army was thrown into by the blowing up of their ammunition wagons to fall on them with his cavalry. The total defeat of a detachment commanded by Colonel Bailey is likewise an exploit of Tipu Sahib, who having begun, who having began like Alexander to gain battles at the age of 18, continues to march in the steps of that Grecian hero, whom he may one day resemble as well by the heroism of his actions. Next slide, please. CWF Dumas in his letter in French to John Adams dated 15th February 1781 from The Hague, wrote that the British affairs in India were in a bad state. He wrote that Hyder Ali with French help had gained an upper hand over them. A Swiss journalist, Dumas was a secret agent of the United States and a friend of Benjamin Franklin. While he resided in The Hague, a code that he developed help the American revolutionaries secretly communicate with their confidants in Europe. Next slide, please. Edmund Jennings Randolph communicated a more detailed account of Hyder Ali's campaign to John Adams on April 14, April 4th, 1781 from Brussels. He wrote about the receipt of a London-based newspaper that gave an insight of events from across the globe that were of consequence to the American Revolution. It included information about Hyder Ali's army of 80,000 horses and his siege of Arcot, whose Nawab was an ally of the English. It narrated the route of Colonel Bailey and Colonel Fletcher, together with the loss of 400 Europeans and 4,000 Indian sepoys. It mentioned Hyder Ali's territorial gains and the narrow escape of Colonel Munro to Madras. Randolph was an aide de camp to General George Washington in 1775 and was America's second Secretary of State, succeeding Thomas Jefferson in 1794. Four days later, a 13 year old boy wrote to his mother from Leiden about Hyder Ali's victories and also mentioned the death of Colonel Fletcher and the capture of Colonel Bailey. The boy was John Quincy Adams, who became the sixth president of America in 1825. Benjamin Franklin wrote to Samuel Huntington from Passy on May 14, 1781 about the worsening state of British affairs in India. Huntington was president of the Continental Congress from September 28, 
1779 to July 6, 1781. He was one of the 56 signers of Declaration of Independence. On the same day, Benjamin Franklin also wrote to Marquis de Lafayette. He said, if the English, whom he compared to a drunken dicer, lost their commerce in India, it would lead to their overall loss of power. De Lafayette was a French aristocrat who supported the Revolutionary War even before the French king did. On May 22, 1781, John Adams wrote to Abigail Adams from Amsterdam and informed her of English territorial and trade losses in India. William Heath wrote to George Washington from Roxbury on June 18, 1781, that the French army had attained military success in the East Indies and Great Britain was close to losing all its territories, territories there. Heath was a commander of the Lower Hudson District in the, in the Continental Army. At that time, Washington was with the main army in Yorktown. Next slide, please. John Adams wrote to John Jay on August 13, 1782 from The Hague and urged the American revolutionaries to remain steadfast in their thirst for an independent America. He wrote that Fitzherbert's commission was constituted in the United States, which was authorized to work with four powers that were at war with Great Britain. Statesman John Jay later became America's first chief justice and also its acting secretary of state and secretary of foreign affairs. The four great powers that were at war with Britain probably refer to the United States of America, the Mysore Kingdom under Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan, the French and the Dutch. Now let's speak of what happened um, about after the negotiations and the peace. Hyder Ali died on December 7th, 1782. Tipu succeeded him and the second Anglo-Mysore war rumbled on. On January 28th, 1782, an end to hostilities was conceived in the form of a provisional peace treaty before the warring, between the warring European nations, that is Spain, French, and Britain, as well as America. Peace was formalized between Britain and the United States on September 3rd at Paris. It finally ended the war and accorded British recognition of an independent America along with its boundaries. C.W.S. Dumas wrote to John Adams on December 12, 1783 from The Hague about the ongoing ne negotiations in pr Paris between the Americans, the British, and other players, particularly the French. The spirits of the Americans received a boost when they received news of the British having sustained another defeat in India. Next slide, please. Now let's look at uh, Thomas Jefferson's letters about Tipu's embassy in France. Thomas Jefferson is a founding father of America and the principal author of the Declaration of Independence. He was the nation's third president. After America formally gained independence from Britain, he was the country's ambassador to France. In 1787, when Jefferson was serving at Paris, Tipu Sultan sent an embassy to France. In his official correspondence from Paris, Jefferson provided and received regular updates on the reception of Tipu's ambassadors at the French court. Next slide, please. On 10th August, 1788, Thomas Jefferson in his letter from Paris to John Jay 
wrote that Tipu's ambassadors were received by the French king. And I quote his letter. Tipu Sahib's ambassadors had the reception today at Versailles with unusual pomp. The presence was so numerous that little could be caught of what they said to the king and what he answered to them. Such is the fascinating history of Tipu Sultan and Hyder Ali who influenced America's war of independence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amin Saab. I thought that you will continue for a while. And it was quite revealing, you know, many things that really we didn't know. Um, some of the very uh, new thing that came. So let's uh, hear from our esteemed Professor Muqtadar Saab uh, for his concluding remarks. And after that, we will be having a question and answer session. Thank you very much and Muqtadar Saab. Uh, thank you, Radhi Saab. Uh, thank you for hosting this event. Thank you for inviting me and including me in this fascinating discussion. I also want to thank Professor uh, Dr. Nazir Saab for, for an interesting overview at the beginning. And of course, uh, uh, much congratulations to Professor Amin Ahmed for his interesting research. So I have a, a dilemma as to how to respond. Uh, it is very fascinating and uh, also distracting because I was just listening to you, uh, et cetera. So the question to me is, do I respond to you as a person of Indian origin living in America who is excited that the foundations of this country are not independent of Indian Muslim contribution? I think the biggest conclusion that I can draw from your uh, presentation is that Indian Muslims who live in America and are now American citizens can think of themselves as kind of pioneers that while we may not have been physically here fighting for America, we were here in the spirit fighting for American independence since American leadership, American founding fathers, the revolutionaries here uh, were uh, motivated, inspired, uh, and were also co-opponents of the British. Uh, so in fact, uh, on July 4th, I always make this comment that uh, as an Indian Muslim in America, I'm one of those few people uh, who, who was part of the community which kicked the British out of two continents. Uh, one in Asia, the biggest colony in Asia, which was India, and then the biggest colony in the West, which was North America. Uh, but I also want to react uh, and respond to you as an academic to academic uh, as to what you can do with these findings. Uh, and I'm sure that you would, I saw uh, an article of yours which also addressed this issue which is available on the web. So I see this as preliminary collection of data from primary sources which have become available after the digitization of some of the foundational papers of this country. Uh, but I feel that there is a need to construct a narrative as to what is the actual extent of uh, the connection. Uh, I mean, we can say that they were inspired, uh, but, but they, when you actually scrutinize the references, then uh, let me give you an example, a metaphor. Let's say we find an Eskimo in Alaska who has a dog and the dog's name is Babar, or has a horse and the horse name is Babar. That is not just the glory of Babar. Babar was so famous, so great, that uh, somebody as far away in Alaska in a small town heard about his greatness. But it also tells us that the person who named his horse as Babar had a cosmopolitan view had a worldview, living in a small town in Alaska, went to the library, somehow discovered Babar, and then read the history of Babar, and then was inspired by Babar, and was open-minded enough to name one of his most important <laughs> animals or friends or, uh, or assets after Babar. So one of the stories which is inherent in your story 
is the global perspective with which the founding fathers of America approached. I mean, they, according to you, they were on keeping an hourly eyesight on what was happening in Mysore in the battle, right? That was incredible. So they were using what telegraph, nothing else was possible to get uh, hourly messages from India uh, about what was going on on the East Indies front. So to me, that was remarkable that the founding fathers were not insular. They were looking at it from the global perspective and uh, keeping an eye on British uh, battles across the world. I also would like you to take a, go back a couple of steps and look at the Seven Years' War, uh, in which George Washington basically fought. Uh, and uh, that goes back to the Battle of Plassey at the same time that Robert Clive. And if you look at, uh, say, William Dalrymple's uh, latest book, The Anarchy, in which he describes the Battle of Plassey, uh, some of the liberties that uh, Robert Clive took uh, with the French and, the, and there, he would not have dared to do that if, it, if the Seven Year War was not going on and also the growing influence of the French uh, uh, in what later becomes uh, the Mysore kingdoms of uh, Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan. So I think the story begins there because George Washington also fought uh, in the Seven Years War. Uh, and, and so the so that is a, 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 an interesting thing to include. I also would like you to see, the key question is why did somebody name a boat Hyder Ali? Uh, what, were they inspired because the founding fathers were writing letters to each other about Hyder Ali and his stuff or the other way around? Uh, what really was happening was the Tipu Sultan and Hyder Ali were very popular in the US media. So, one parallel source that you could examine is newspapers of that time. Uh, uh, are you physically located in India? I think so, too, right? So, no, if you're no. physically. I'm in Canada. Yeah. Oh, so in then it should not be a, a problem for you to actually do some archival research. Washington, uh, the Library of Congress has uh, small grants which could enable you to come down to DC for a couple of weeks or three, four weeks uh, and uh, check out the, the newspapers uh, in the microfiche sections, et cetera, during those wars. Uh, and if they're not digitized, that is. If they're already digitized, then it's very quickly to find out as to how frequently and, and what the tone and what, what if they just reporting like this is happening, the British are losing, the British are losing, or they were also talking about Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan's bravery and glory and their values and what they were fighting for, etc. So from there, you will be able to draw definitive conclusions of what the nature of inspiration was. So, so for example, uh, you could be happy that somebody is defeating your enemy without being inspired by that person because you just want your enemy to lose. But it is also possible that your enemy, your enemy becomes not just your friend, but also someone worthy of admiration and inspiration. And it is obvious that the media was covering them very positively to such an extent that somebody felt that they should name a ship Hyder Ali. Uh, one technical thing that if you look at the media sources about Hyder Ali, the ship, there seems to be some confusion in the historical accord. Uh, the battle against uh, the monk was fought in 1782, right? Uh, in fact, it was fought right across from where I'm living off the coast of Delaware. Uh, and, uh, but there are some discrepancies. According to some historical reports, uh, the Hyder Ali went all the way to Africa and captured three of British ships uh, and sent them back, which then the British rescued. But the dates are 1813, 1814 for the activities of Hyder Ali. Whereas uh, it is possible that Hyder Ali was commissioned in 17, uh, fifth, uh, 79 or 1780 by Pennsylvania. So, so just check on that. It is quite possible that if, if that discrepancy is existing or that Hyder Ali had such a long lifespan is important. And, and issues of how many guns, for example, 
the military records show that Hyder Ali had 16 guns. Uh, uh, the historical records tend to show six guns. And the, the description of the battle is also very interesting against the monks. Um, your uh, audience may be interested that Captain Barney told his uh, sailors to follow the contrary, which means that whatever order he gave, they should do the opposite. So when they were fighting in close quarters with the monk, he ordered that they should turn towards, I think, starboard. And the monk's captain heard that command and he prepared to fire in such a way, but uh, Hyder Ali turned in the other way and then sank the monk within a battle that lasted less than 30 minutes. So it's an interesting for those of you who are actually interested in, in the battles uh, that were fought. I also want to emphasize that we should not confuse the East India Company for the British. Uh, East India Company was, India was under East India Company until 1857. And then after that, only part of the British. So, so the damage that is done to East India Company does not necessarily translate directly to the military losses of the British Empire or the British forces. Uh, and so you should at least acknowledge that, that the losses would be in terms of revenues or finances from loss of colonies. So if they had lost colonies. Uh, and, and surprisingly, there was a time in the 18th century when the East India Company probably had more soldiers uh, under its command than the British army itself. Um, and there's also an interesting connection there. General Cornwallis, who was defeated uh, on land in the United States, uh, was serving in the British army. And then he retired after his defeat. I think he went to Ireland for a few years and then went into the service of East India Company and came down and fought. Uh, and uh, he became very notorious I think for the Battle of Sirangapatnam, et cetera. So Cornwallis was also a connection between uh, the British and India. What is also critical about the Cornwallis connection was that the gentleness with which he handled the American revolutionaries is startlingly different from the brutality with which he responded against Indians in Karnataka, you will not recognize the two Cornwallises. The guy was like a gentleman here because he was fighting white people of perhaps Anglo-Saxon descent, but he was quite brutal and devious uh, when he was operating uh, as East India Company. Uh, it is quite possible, like the modern analogy, you retire from the Marines and then you go and work for Blackwater, <laughs> you become a different kind of a person as a mercenary. So that is also an interesting issue that I would like you to. Uh, the story is very one-sided. Were there any elephants in the Tipu Sultan's army that were named after Washington or were the Tipu Sultan and others uh, as impressed with our founding fathers as our founding fathers were impressed with them? That's, that side of the story is, is uh, quite blank in your narrative. It is quite possible there not, may not be as much of sources available. So I would like you to check perhaps if there are Indian media reports reporting uh, or East India companies reports um, uh, about how the, the battle in America was impacting the Mysore. Uh, it would be interesting for your audience to know that the Boston Tea Party, the tea that was thrown into the sea was East India Company's tea. So, so there is a, a very interesting connection. Uh, my daughter goes to Yale and she was telling me that Yale was founded by a guy whose last name was Yale, who made the earliest payment uh, from income while working in, in Madras for East India Company. So the founder of Yale University made his millions or whatever thousands of pounds uh, in East India Company. So I'm going to stop with that and also going to refer to you that all references to Tipu Sultan and Hyder Ali were not positive, were positive perhaps in the US, but there was also a lot of negative coverage of them in England press. So there are these stories of uh, uh, forcible circumcision uh, of British soldiers who were captured by 
uh, Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan. So there's this story that goes on. Uh, it was quite uh, widely covered uh, in the British press at that time. We don't know the veracity of this, where they're just maligning them, or was there any truth that there was an attempt to forcibly convert soldiers? Uh, but Jane Austen, in one of her novels, The Sense and Sensibility, talks about an older colonel who was interested in one of the three daughters uh, who, who are key to that story, The Sense and Sensibility. Uh, that colonel apparently had fought uh, uh, in, the, in the Mysore wars uh, for East India Company. So there is a lot of um, interesting literary uh, and media and historical coverage of Tipu Sultan uh, and uh, Hyder Ali uh, in Western media, which I would recommend that you also access uh, along with, uh, with the, the documents that are available on the digital port of University of Virginia. So with that, I'm going to stop and I hope my comments were helpful and beneficial. Thank you. Thank you, Mukhtar Saab. It was quite a good a review of what uh, Amin Saab has presented. Uh, perhaps now is the question and answer session, but before that, Faisal, uh, just show the upcoming Saturday event. Uh, we have not uh, received the poster yet. So uh, with my part of my name, <laughs> Professor Raziuddin Akhil uh, is a famous professor of history at University of Delhi. He's going to talk on history in public domain, some critical concerns on coming Saturday. Uh, he will be introduced by Professor Parul Pandya Dar, uh, who is uh, also from University of Delhi, a history professor. And the concluding remarks will be given by Professor Farhat Nasreen from Jamia. Uh, and so now after that, we have now the question as a session. Our esteemed moderator is on vacation. So today I request uh, Faisal to take this extra responsibility. Faisal, can you do that? Yes, yes, sir. Um, for, you know, he will be moderating it and he will control when to, who is going to ask and how to ask. Uh, so over to you, uh, Faisal. Thank you. Okay, so um, let me go with the people who have raised their hands already. So first one is uh, Rudran Shu Singh. Please go ahead and mute yourself and ask your question, please. Well, my question is to Professor Amin that uh, his lecture was very enlightening and please accept my Eid greetings. But uh, my question would be that uh, if at all, as you say, that there was a strong connection between Hyder Ali, Tipu Zultan and the American War of Independence, then why the Americans did not come to India's rescue in the 1857 War of Indian Independence? In 1857, America was much more stronger than what it used to be in the 1780s or 1790s. Thank you, Sudanshu. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very good question. I think the interest of Americans uh, uh, perhaps was restricted to how they could benefit from the trade. Um, if you look at the letters that are there in the US uh, Congress library, the interest of Americans started to wane after the peace in India. Uh, it, it, it started to wane uh, you know, after the peace happened in America. So their interest in America it basically subsided. It, the, the American revolutionaries interest in India subsided after the peace in 1783, 1784. And uh, they were more you know, looking at the opportunities for trade in India. So if you look at the correspondence of the founding fathers after the peace in 1784, so their letters, uh, you know, they, they indicate that, you know, they wanted trading opportunities in India. In fact, they established their first um, trading, uh, you know, mission in India in 1786 at Kolkata. And uh, whoever had the upper hand, they would deal with them. So it is simple. It's, it's the economic interests that, uh, that shaped their relations post the peace that happened. 
So I would not be surprised that they didn't come to India's aid. Like even after, even after uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting that in 1796, three years before his death, uh, George Washington in his letter, uh, he writes, um, you know, I don't care about what, you know, what is happening to Tipu Sahib. So that, has, that was perhaps the last reference to Tipu Sultan in uh, the correspondence of uh, the American uh, the revolutionaries. So yeah, so to me, it is not surprising that uh, they were not interested in India because it's, it's the economic interests that guide uh, the political decisions and you know, the geopolitical decisions, just like today, it was then as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, yeah. Dr. Abdullabar, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so great uh, presentations. Um, I read, uh, I think uh, you're all familiar with uh, uh, Professor Jill Lepore history, uh, the, uh, the, these truths, uh, a brief history of the United States of America. I read it as a 900 page uh, treaty. <laughs> uh, so I, I think, uh, uh, what I'm trying to say, but because what have really uh, filled in, uh, uh, I think something it is not there in the history in that uh, what uh, Jill Lepore uh, wrote uh, in 900 pages. So what I was interested in, I think that Dr. Muktadar uh, Khan uh, alluded to, probably are you in the process of writing a, a book on this, uh, on this chapter? the link between uh, America's independence and Hyder Ali, uh, uh, Tipa Sultan uh, regime era. Uh, that will be really wonderful uh, for uh, people like, you know, I'm, I'm a, even though I'm a scientist, I, I'm a biologist, I, I, I never knew anything about uh, this history, you know? So I think it's very important uh, to really bring to, uh, to the, uh, the attention of the commoners like me uh, to fill in. Uh, that's what I, I just wanted to uh, uh, see whether you are in the process of thinking about uh, writing a book on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'm in the process of writing the book and uh, I'm almost done. So hopefully ah, by the end- That's hopefully great. By the, yeah, hopefully by the end of the year, it should be, uh, it should take a concrete form. And I've con covered uh, most of the points that were raised by uh, Muktadar uh, Saab as well. Uh, for example, you know, um, like he uh, he alluded to the news reports of uh, Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan in America in uh, in 1780s. So I did some research on that as well. Uh, I looked at some of the archives, the newspaper archives, and. Uh, to me, what I found is probably the first time the name Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan came to America was uh, either through this letter of um, Comte de Tresson uh, in 1777, or perhaps uh, the race horses. There were, there were race horses that were named after Tipu Sultan and Hyder Ali as early as 1777. So that, that, that is probably, like if you look at the documents, if you research, According to my research, what I found is that is the earliest I've been able to go back to. Perhaps there is there might be somebody else who can look into this and who can trace back uh, exactly how the names came. That's one. And uh, then again, uh, Muqtadar Saab also asked about uh, the USS Hyder Ali in 1813. So just like races, just like multiple race horses that were named after Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan, there were multiple ships that were named after Hyder Ali uh, and Tipu Sultan. And uh, that happened in USA, that happened in England, and that happened in Australia as well. There is a ship somewhere, I think, in 1850s or 1860s, which carried refugees from, I think, England, um, uh, from Ireland, I think. From, it carried refugees from Ireland to Australia. And the name of that ship, I think, was Tipu Sahib. So, uh, yeah, they, they were very cosmopolitan, the American founding fathers. They were very cosmopolitan. They, were, they had a worldview and, uh, yeah, and their descendants as well. So they had this view. And, uh, and then there were also, uh, uh, there was another point that he raised about East India Company and the British, where the one and the same. Uh, that's a very, very, very interesting point he raised. Um, Although technically they were not one and the same. If you look at the decisions that guided the East India Company, 
it were basically you know they were the they were guided uh, by trade by economic concerns and uh, you know the way the british parliament uh, intervened in the functioning of the east india company even before 1857 when the company uh, you know e e even after 1857 when the company you know it became like uh, um, an unknown entity because the raj the government directly uh, took over the uh, the rule of the of, of india like in 1784 you had this pitts act i believe so they tried to take control of it and then you know uh, there were soldiers uh, who were hired you know the hiring of the soldiers um, who came to india just like who went to america it happened in colleges and in, and in universities across england so the english had a much more uh, direct say and i'm writing about that in my book <laughs> and uh, hopefully that will answer many of the questions that mukhtar saab and others had yeah thank you that's great thank you thank you um mr mike yes uh, you are next assalam alaikum uh, it was a great presentation amin and uh, i am from bangalore and i know so a lot more about tipu sultan and hyder ali i have visited all these places some of the quest first first of all let me show this to you this is a statue made there were about 100 pieces made on his bicentennial on uh, 17 sorry 1999 and i was one of the recipients of uh, this statue uh, razi bhai asked if he can get one i am checking on that see if i can get one and uh, if there is going to be a museum or something about tipu sultan i will go ahead and donate this to uh, that museum because if i die nobody in my family will know what that is so <laughs> the questions i have for you is there was a letter apparently there was a letter tipu sultan wrote to george washington congratulating on july 4 and apparently that letter never reached george washington and apparently it is in a french library want to find out the truth about that and also there were rumors that george washington tipu sultan funded george washington's military expeditions so if you can answer those questions thank you very much wow uh, saab uh, yeah i have heard of these and uh, you know tipu's direct correspondence with washington and you know him funding uh, the united states uh, uh, the revolution um i think the source uh, that has been quoted by quite a few people is a uh, kabir kausar's book uh, the secret correspondences of uh, tipu sultan i think that was written somewhere in uh, 1981 or 82 in early 1980s and uh, to my knowledge unfortunately that has been sold sourced from bhagwan gidwani's uh, novel so it's uh, so it's uh, i have i did quite a bit of research then i have a friend of mine uh, mohammad masood who's from bangalore so he wrote directly to uh, the us archives and the answer was in negative so they the the united states government does not have any uh, documentation of tipu either writing to washington or tipu funding the american revolution uh, but as i said you know uh, history and research is all about what you you know discover i'm sure uh, there must be a smoking gun somewhere hopefully somebody will do more research and try to uh, establish the direct connection between tipu and uh, and george washington as well as uh, uh, as well as uh, the funding the funding claims that have been going on and the other question i wanted to ask the other part of the, uh, of the question that i wanted to answer is uh, mukhtadar saab also raised this what was happening in india then how did indians did indians know about american revolution uh, surprisingly yes there is a book seer a muttaqin uh, that book was written by a native historian in 1781 uh, i believe so this man uh, it it is basically a book on uh, moguls the history of moguls and in between the book in between he digresses he goes to america this author goes to america and he writes almost like about three pages uh, about the american revolution so in 1780 you had somebody in india writing about the american revolution so he goes he goes into the causes of the american revolution 
what was happening then, but he does not refer to uh, Tipu Sultan or Hyder in this connection with, uh, with the, the American Revolution. Thank you. I mean, by you mentioned Hyder Ali being of Mughal descent. Where did you draw that from? In the beginning, you said no, no, it, it's a, a it's a, no, no. It, uh, the I, I quoted the letter. So the letter that uh, Comte de Tresan wrote to uh, Franklin. In that letter, he says he quotes Hyder Ali. You know, he says Hyder Ali as a as a brave Mughal prince. Yeah. So uh, Hyder Ali, of course. Uh, he was not directly of uh, uh, of a Mughal uh, descent, uh, although his origins, his his father's origins, his grandfather's origins, they were they were from the Mughal army. Yeah. Thank uh, you, uh, uh, Amir. Bhai, you're next. May I make a quick co yeah. comment on that one, please? Yeah. Yes. Uh, the the context in which we have to understand this reference to Tipu Sultan being a Mughal is the ignorance of the Europeans about India and in general Asia. Now, for instance, when you go back to the Portuguese, before they discovered the sea route around the Cape of Good Hope, they thought that India extended all the way to the river Nile. They referred to the entire area from Nile to, to uh, Malaysia as Greater India, Greater India, and the the uh, Deccan Plateau that jets into the Indian Ocean, they referred to it as Lesser India, and they thought that there was a king somewhere in Ethiopia whose name was Prester John, who was waiting for these Europeans to come in and uh, save the people of Asia from from tyranny, etc. etc. Et so this has to be understood in the context of the ignorance that the Europeans had about India and Asia in general. Okay, uh, Professor Amin Ahmed, thank you very much, scholarly talk, very impressive. Quick comment about the origin of Hyder Ali and Sultan Shahid people. Uh, William Dariample, who has written extensively on Indian history, uh, refers in his book that the origin of uh, Tipu Sultan, Sultan Shahid, and Hyder Ali, in fact, is Punjabi. I don't know the resources. Anyway, coming back to your talk, I'm quite impressed, but I have to say that whatever you have presented has not convinced me there was an extensive influence of the situation in India on for American revolution. There may be some inspiration, I would say, and the means of communication as it was took years, months, for a communication a letter who arrived from India to, uh, at that time, North America. Uh, so the assumption that the world was, it influenced a great deal, to me is not very tenable. Um, the same thing, I want to say something about the, that um, what is great in need at the moment is that um, somebody, like you said, uh, focus on uh, assessing in the current uh, India, the role uh, with uh, Sultan Shahid and Heather really played in, in this time. There was a lot of misunderstanding uh, has been created uh, about Tipu Sultan. And um, it was uh, for a while, uh, he was considered very tolerant, very uh, modern, very farsighted. And then I think in lately the situation has been reversed and uh, this very great need for somebody to evaluate that. The other thing I want to say is that, yes, there is uh, whatever evidence there may be of uh, any inspiration to the American Revolution by the Tipu uh, Sultan, Sultan Shahid. But certainly there is a strong evidence that he was in correspondence with Napoleon and even the last king, uh, uh, French king, who was uh, removed. And, uh, in fact, uh, Napoleon, when he attacked Egypt, he was aiming for getting to India and joining up with, uh, with Tipu Sultan and his armies. In fact, if that would have happened, of course, he was stopped. If it would have happened, probably India would have been replaced the British uh, monarchy or colonialism by French, which probably wasn't very uh, preferable. And finally, last point, I want to say that this idea that India uh, Indians were uh, versus British is not quite right because the defeat of 
Tipu Sultan, Sultan Shahid was largely um, uh, was inflicted by British, but they were supported by Heather, um, by Hyderabad, uh, Nizam's armies and Marathas. And a lot of people serving in the company, uh, East India Company were Indians and not British. There were not that many British. So thank you for your patience. Faisal, are there more questions? There, there are no more questions at this no more question? Uh, okay. So, yeah. Uh, well, so, if there are not any more questions, let me have one from my side. And then we can open just as a open, because, you know, it's a early. Uh, we usually go for more than one or beyond one. But uh, people will have more chance to interact with each other. That's a good thing. Um, the question was really, I was just like Amir Bhav is saying that uh, uh, there was too much that was made out of Tipu Sultan and Hyder Ali's influence on American War of Independence. Uh, there could be some kind of storyline going into Britain, British press or in American at that time that there are some defeats, local defeats in Mesur area, defeats uh, of British and all those. But I was surprised too that there was no mention of Napoleon and all those things that though, you know, there is a clear, we as you, you know, naive students of history used to know that, you know, Napoleon was in Egypt and there was some kind of correspondence like about these rockets and all those things. There was no mention at all about all this. Perhaps uh, uh, that would have been a much bigger uh, storyline in this, if there was any influence. Uh, well, but as we all know, um, that Tipu was or is still considered by great many of Indians as a real war, you know, um, hero uh, who fought uh, valiantly against British, uh, didn't surrender to them in spite of all uh, they see other prince and other people you know, aligning with Britishers. Uh, but lately, as uh, somebody mentioned, uh, that though this, this is not your topic of interest, uh, there is a big uh, thing going on in India just to defame Tipu. Per perhaps it is part of larger, uh, larger Hindutva project, you know, somehow to defame all who were even good or who belong to the particular community. Uh, Tipu was known very secular, Tipu was known very tolerant, but at the same time now we are knowing that Tipu was ruthless and against certain section of Hindus uh, or even Christians. Uh, and there is a constant barrage going against even Congress that why they celebrated Tipu's uh, anniversary and all those things. So thank you anyway.